This is Book TV's Afterwards podcast. This week, political commentator Candace Owens discusses why black Americans should vote Republican. She'll be interviewed by Matt Schlapp, chair of the American Conservative Union. Candace Owens, my great friend, how are you today? I am doing great. It's been an exciting couple of weeks, so um, everything is good this moment. Uh, it's great to read your book. What an inspiring story and a provocative book. So if people are really interested in what's going on in all these big debates in our country today, it's the book to read. But what I was taken aback more than anything is the story of the impact of your grandparents. Yeah, I really wanted to talk a lot more about my personal story because in politics, it's really fashionable for the media to create caricatures of every single person involved in politics, right? So you've got evil Trump, mean Candace, um, and people actually be, start to think that these people um, are what they read. And I had realized that the media had created a caricature of me, of someone who sort of got into this for selfish reasons. And I wanted to present to people where my, consu- my conservative roots began, um, where I went astray and sort of thought liberalism was the right path for me. Um, And it really all begins with my grandparents, uh, who were staunch conservatives and raised me conservatively. Um, So it was nice to be able to tell the story of my grandfather, uh, his life beginning on a sharecropping farm uh, as a worker, and then his life ending on that same sharecropping farm as the owner of it. And what those lessons taught me about uh, sort of the way Black Americans view their circumstances today. Well, if your grandfather uh, was voting in 2020 or opining on politics, Uh, what would his views be? Conservative all the way. Um, and, And the reasons for that is just because what the left has become is virtually against every single value that has been instilled in Black America since the times of slavery. Uh, which I lay out that argument in my chapter on slavery. Uh, The Black community is a tremendously faithful community. We have values. We believe in family. Everything that you're seeing right now that the left is pushing for is an attack on the family. It's an attack on the nuclear family. It's an attack on Americanism, the way things have been traditionally um, in, in favor of some Marxist utopian future that they think, egalitarian future that they think can exist, but of course we know can't. And I wanted to make sure that Black Americans understood that the only way any group that's lagging behind one group gets ahead is through hard work and no shortcuts. You talk in the book about coming up with this movement called Blexit, and uh, and you compare it to Brexit. Uh, Give us a little bit about your thinking, your creativity, and why that kind of captured uh, the state of things for you. Well, actually, Matt, the irony is that when I came up with Flexit, it was at CPAC. Um, yes. It was my first time at CPAC. Uh, and I had to decide between doing an interview, a radio interview on Radio Row to try to get my name out because not many people knew me, even though you had invited me to do a panel um, or going to see the president speak for the first time. And I made the decision to do this interview. When the interview concluded, I raced to the doors. And of course, security, the Secret Service had shut everything down. So that meant I was left to go backstage into a little room. So I had a speaker pass to watch it from the small screens. And when I got into that small room, Nigel Farage was there. And I thought to myself, oh, that's the guy who's leading uh, Brexit, the British exit. And it instantly clicked in that moment that there needed to be a brand and a movement that believed in Blexit, a black exit, a black exit from progressivism, a black exit from liberalism, a black exit from what I believe to be mental enslavement that's actually stopping us um, from preventing us from going into our futures with positivity um, and able to earn our spot in America as we should be. And um, I, I'm essentially set up Blexit as the antithesis of everything that Black Lives Matter believes in, that you can lie at riot, that you can uh, loot, that you can lie, and that this country somehow should be giving you something because of those values, um, or, or lack of values, I should say. And we've done that. We created the 501c3. Uh, Blexit is now in 25 states in inner city communities. Uh, we invite events every weekend, like Back the Blue, making sure that Black young children have a realistic viewpoint of what law enforcement officers are doing in their communities. They're not there to kill them. They're there to protect them. Uh, and it's been a tremendous, it's just been a tremendous journey. And it's, it really is due to that one moment at CPAC getting locked out <laughs> from <a> speech. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the great things that happen at CPAC aren't on the stage. It's when <laughs> yeah, interesting, interesting people things. have a chance to think or talk to each other and collaborate. But you, it, the, the, besides, you're obviously a person who has her own mind, 
you have your own opinions, you have this great story about how your grandparents intervened in your life. But another characteristic of this great book is your perspective on the historical facts as uh, black Americans got rights and uh, played that role in society as you know uh, fully empowered citizens. Um, and you compare, uh, or we can all compare the violence that's going on in our cities today. You mentioned Black Lives Matter and the creation of the Klan um, so long ago and its recreation. Uh, help viewers understand what your perspective is on the ugly history of the Klan in America and its impact on black Americans. Absolutely. Um, you know, what I what I try to do via my Blex movement and in this book is to really sort of just tell the truth, right? My job is very easy. What we have to do is try to get in front of all of these lies that are perpetuating. Uh, people have no idea about American history. They don't know what actually happened in this country. Um, things have become popular to say that make entirely no sense, right? America was built off of the back of slaves. Uh, the Democrat Party is progressive and, and, and the exact, they're the exact opposite. Everything the Democrat Party um, has touched in terms of black America has harmed black America. I like to say there's something about progressive principles that all always lead to aggressive results for minority communities. That's just something I've realized. Um, they're always pretending they're going to help when in fact they're hurting because what the left believes in and what the left relies on is a permanent underclass. This is why they harp so much on division. This is why Marxism is really the tenet of all of their principles. Uh, they need the versus mentality. They need white versus blacks, heterosexuals versus homosexuals, um, uh, short people versus tall people, fat people versus skinny people. And you keep going, what is all of this? Why are you just trying to make people divide? because they, they truly believe that once you divide, you can conquer, right? From chaos, a dictatorship can arise. The government can seize full power, everything that conservatives are against. Um, and for Black America, it was important for them to know the real history of all of that helping that they keep telling you about. Um, currently in the public school system, Black Americans learn that Lyndon Baines Johnson was a heroic president because he inked the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. Uh, this is so ridiculous, it's, almost, it's to the point that it should be humorous. Uh, this man was an avowed racist. In his 20 plus years in Senate, he voted against every single measure um, to, to give Black Americans progress and agency in this country. He was a part of the Southern Bloc in the Senate that wanted to make sure that Black Americans remained underclass. You know, lo and behold, JFK gets shot, he gets thrust into the presidency, and he's essentially forced to sign the Civil Rights Act because of the riots that are taking place throughout the country. And no sooner did he sign it than he introduced the Great Society Act. Uh, which was a, an attack, a purposeful Machiavellian scheme to attack the Black family and to make sure, as he said, uh, that he would have those N-words voting Democrat for the next 200 years. Um, my job is to disrupt his plans, uh, to make sure that Black Americans are not voting Democrat for the next 200 years, that they realize this scheme of the Democrat Party, um, that they realize that the Democrat Party is out to hurt you, and that the Republican Party has actually always been the, the party of freedom. Uh, I don't believe the Republican Party stands in a platform where they say, we just want to help Black people. That wouldn't be true. What I like about the Republican Party is if you want to work hard in this country, we want to help you. If you want to contribute in this society, we want to help you. If you want to make good decisions, we want to help you. Um, we don't believe in handouts, right? We believe in, 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 in making sure um, that everybody understands the philosophy of America, which is that if you work hard and you stay out of, stay out of trouble, this country will reward you. Now, uh, let me go into this history a little bit because some people will hear your words and they'll say, well, I don't know if I agree with that, right? And this is part of the important thing to go back through our civil rights history, for instance. Do you give Lyndon Baines Johnson, as you said, somebody who ran for office to the House and to the Senate uh, as a segregationist, do you give him some credit for at least shifting when the mantle of power came to him? He decided he wanted to be the president of civil rights. And there have been movies and books you mentioned in your book, The Great, uh, books by Robert Caro and stuff that talk about this juxtaposition between Lyndon Johnson, who had been an avowed segregationist, a racist. Next thing you know, he uses those legislative powers to try to get these uh, civil rights laws passed. Can people change an office and do you give him at least the credit for the fact that he did use his powers to get that law passed? As I said, uh, Lyndon, Lyndon B. Johnson did that with a figurative gun to his head. He didn't pass it. Uh, uh, we did that because of Republicans that, that passed that and he had to sign it. What was he, he could have vetoed it um, and, and said, you know, I, I really am just a racist. But as I said, 
because of what was going on in the country. And this is what, you know, the anachronistic argument, well, he did eventually ink it, sure, but this man was an avowed racist. He hated black America. Um, and he kept that up by creating uh, the Great Society Act. That's why it's so important for black Americans to go pursue Lyndon, Lyndon B. Johnson's quotes after signing it. You know, he, he said, these N words are getting uppity now. You know, we, we have to give them something, just a little bit of something uh, to keep them distracted so we can ensure that we have their vote for the next 200 years. Uh, what he wanted was power uh, and he was willing to, to give an inch so that the Democrat Party could get a mile. Uh, so no, uh, I think he is one of the most despicable presidents that's ever sat in, in the White House, um, not just because of things that he did uh, to Black America, but also because of his record on Vietnam War and, and things that he knew that was going on. Um, and and so, uh, and, and it, I think it's, it's crazy that Black Americans don't know any of this. Uh, we really are just taught in school when I was in the public school system that he was the best thing that's ever happened for Black Americans, and that isn't true. Uh, I would say the best president for Black Americans is sitting in the Oval Office today. Well, and polls show that uh, African Americans across the country and poll after poll are saying uh, to this question of what do you have to lose? And it seems like more of them anyway are breaking towards uh, Donald Trump's way. Let's go back to the Republican Party's history. Um, it's a great, uh, the origins of the Republican Party was obviously an anti-slavery party. Um, when uh, black Americans got the chance to vote, they started to vote overwhelmingly for the Republican Party, but the Repu Republican Party itself earned a bit of scorn uh, as they embraced what was called the Southern strategy under Richard Nixon. You know, Jackie Robinson had been a longtime Republican. Martin Luther King Sr. had been a longtime Republican. But in the 60s, it seemed like the Republican Party seemed to bobble the ball with these important voters. Um, I think, you know, that's our history that we have to you know, talk about as well. Do you see those mistakes in the Republican Party? And do you believe that the party is nothing like that today? Um, I would say the Republican Party is not perfect, but I, I would say that the reason that they lost here with the black vote wasn't necessarily because of their shortcomings, but more because of the Democrats started offering free stuff. The first time that you see black Americans begin to break in with the Republican Party is actually, uh, you know, with the New Deal, with FDR and the New Deal. That was the first year, I think, uh, don't quote me, but 19, sometime in the 1930s was the first time they overwhelmingly voted uh, to make sure FDR got in. He was promising handouts. Um, and, and by the way, by every metric, people, economists that have examined um, the, the New Deal backwards say that he actually made the Great Depression last about five years longer than it needed to because of these handouts not allowing the economy to correct itself. Um, so uh, then you, you fast forward, obviously, and what, when things really cracked was with Lyndon Baines Johnson um, and him offering, he, did, he gave that speech. Uh, that notorious speech at Howard saying, you know, black Americans, you've been treated wrong. And now the government has to not just give you equality, but we have to give you equality plus uh, benefits. And that plus benefits was welfare. Um, so it, what we're really seeing is that the strategy has kind of remained the same um, in the Democrat Party. They've been consistent in realizing that if they offer handouts that black Americans will go, oh, that looks good without reading the fine print. And the fine print is always that these things always invariably harm black American society. A really interesting um, um, uh, a point in society to observe, actually, and I'll ask the question and, and not assuming you would possibly know this answer, but uh, when was the last time that black unemployment uh, was lower for black Americans and for white Americans? The answer to that is in 1930. What changed in 1931? Um, the government decided to get involved and issue a, a federal minimum wage, uh, which meant that black Americans couldn't compete. And it was done because because of racists, because of Democrat racists in Congress saying they didn't want Black Americans taking their jobs. Uh, so they instituted, in 1931, it was called the Davis-Bacon Act, uh, which federalized the minimum wage, and it hurt Black Americans. And, um, and so all of these things are really interesting to examine. That at every point that the government gets involved, Black America gets hurt. So what I'm proposing in my book is step away. Right? We need less government, limited government, um, and to give people actually free agency in their lives. It is not the responsibility, and this is one of the biggest points in my book towards white Americans who keep asking me, what can we do to help? My answer is stop helping. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, there right. are, what can I do to keep helping you know, white Americans? I don't wake up every day with that burden. Uh, you have to want to help you as an individual. Start seeing black Americans not as a collective, but as individuals. Um, right. and, and that will be the thing that emboldens people to embrace their futures. So this is mo much more of a libertarian idea, kind of self-help, pull your, uh, you know, take care of your own life. But uh, when I go to the polling, and I, I did check some polling in preparation for this interview, I was 
kind of shocked, and I actually saw it made some news in the last Gallup poll, that 25% of African Americans call themselves conservative. Um, is that shocking to you, or, or is, that, is that a story that you're trying to get out there because you know it to be true? I know it to be true, and I've been saying this to, to, since the beginning. You show me a black American, I'll show you someone who's conservative and doesn't know it. Of uh, a time that, and, and this is because one thing that Republicans are really bad is getting out their message. And this is what I've tried to be different about um, in, in in joining this conservative movement. Is we we have to realize what the left won was the culture war, right? They were they were doing things. They were the ones on TV. They were being funnier. Everything was done at the expense of Republicans. And we allowed them to create a caricature of a Republican, a stiff white guy who doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't like anything about culture and stays away with it and is uncomfortable. And Trump has actually given a window of opportunity because he's so cultural, because he's so funny, because he's so different. Um, for us to really say that's actually not uh, what the... Republican Party of today is. Republican Party of today is extremely diverse. We have so many different talents. We've got comedians. Uh, we've got, you know, the, the youth really now on college campuses fighting back, doing the memes. Um, and this is going to be the stuff that really secures the future. And I think that Black Americans are finally being exposed more through this conduit to conservative ideas. I mean, I fostered my career on social media. Uh, you know, I use Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, and they know that. They understand that this represents an Achilles heel for the Democrat Party. Um, it's why they're trying to get a stranglehold on social media, and they're trying to censor conservative voices, because the liberals may have won TV, but conservatives are winning the internet. So more polling, which I thought was interesting, uh, with all of the this tumult going on in our major cities and really around the country, even in small towns um, about Black Lives Matter. I was surprised in that same Gallup poll to show that 61% uh, of black voters, blacks generally support the cops. Um, this is one of these weird things where you have what most white people would view as the dynamic force in black America as Black Lives Matter, which I'm sure you have an opinion on, mm -hmm. and it's number one policy goal of six or eight or 10, which are pretty radical, but the first one is to fund the cops Yet polling shows that people who live in these cities, people of color, black Americans, um, they're worried if the cops walk away. Did this, does this poll surprise you? It didn't surprise me at all, you know, um, because the inner cities understand what it means when you remove cops. Um, they understand that that means that it creates a vacuum and somebody else rises up to replace them. And that somebody is usually gangsters and thugs. And this is why you're seeing an increase across inner cities to the tune of 200% in terms of shooting relative to last year before this defund the police movement started on the radical left. Um, and so what's also interesting about Black Lives Matter, and I'm sure you've seen this, is for whatever reason, whenever I see a tape of Black Lives Matter, they look remarkably white. Um, it almost looks like Antifa is just changing their t-shirts. <laughs> it said Antifa last week and now they're saying, oh, DOJ is cracking down on Antifa, so we're going to do this under Black Lives Matter. Um, so this movement that we're seeing, this Marxist push, has nothing to do with Black people. In fact, we can prove it invariably harms, once again, progressive policies, these to progressive results for Black America. Uh, it harms Black Americans and Black Americans see that. And one of my favorite things to see, and I, I don't know if you've seen it on the internet, but there are tons of times where the Black Lives Matter protesters who happen to be Caucasians show up and they get chased out of these neighborhoods by the Black Americans that live there. Um, and, and they're getting bold and they're saying, get out of our neighborhoods. You don't care when so-and-so gets shot every other weekend, but you want to show up when it fits your political narrative. And that's the truth. Um, this is about the undoing of society, uh, making sure that there's no, there is no law enforcement. When there's no law enforcement to protect the people um, and, and, and launching this war again allows these Marxists to rise up and destroy the fabric of our nation. So when you see, like you said, white people wearing Black Lives Matter t-shirts, and of course Antifa and these other groups might be involved as well, some of the pushback on your point of view would be, hey, at least white people are getting into this fight to try to help black people. And your point would be, that's not what the fight, their fight isn't about white or black, their fight is about Marxism. It's about Marxism and it's about, you know, for them, it's about this election. I either had a crystal ball, Matt, or uh, I, we knew this was going to happen because for the last three years I've been saying, just wait until Black Lives Matter 2020 is going to hit the scene like you've never seen it before. And this is even worse than I could have possibly predicted. And the reason for that is because of the polls that you just spoke about. Black Americans are, are starting to realize, wait a second, I'm a conservative. I don't support this lawlessness. I don't want to be a part of this. How horrible it is for every Black American to have to have an 
opinion of us, that we all think this, that we all believe in the breakdown of family, that we all want to defund the police. I mean, that is racism in essence, right? Assuming that one, a group of people, a collective has a bunch of attributes because of the color of our skin. We don't. We're individuals in the black community as well. And the overwhelming majority of us do not support this Black Lives Matter narrative. I've talked to some uh, African-American leaders across the country and um, we do a lot of work at the American Conservative Union on criminal justice reform. And one of the things I've been, you know, we work with people on the left on some of these issues. And one of the conversations we've had a private, I won't say who they are, but I always ask them, aren't you disappointed that so much of the corporate philanthropy, so much of the support that's supposedly going to help black people is going to these radicalized organizations? Why don't you just send the money to some black pastors? to That's buy some laptops for mm -hmm. kids who aren't able to go back to their schools and get some counseling for uh, parents, uh, you know, in these black communities, like get the money on the street to help the people. Isn't it ironic that the money doesn't seem to be going there? Instead, the money- Tragic maybe is a better word. Right. Instead, the money seems to be going to destroying black communities. And that's the great irony of Black Lives Matter. No one can answer how the billions of dollars that they have raised on black faces on their website, where's the money going? Um, you know, they don't have corporate headquarters. They don't have offices. It's not going into schools. It's not going into into laptops. Like you said, it's not going into a fund uh, to help kids who can't afford to go to college. Instead, it's going to lawlessness. It's going to busing these people to burn down neighborhoods, take black jobs. You know, when you're burning down Target in Minneapolis, how many black Americans worked at that Target? Um, and they're destroying black communities in the process. You know, at Blexit, what we did is we started a fund um, for black businesses that were destroyed by Black Lives Matter. Um, and and I'm proud to say that we already have given away over $200,000 and to hear these people on the phone crying and saying thank you. Uh, and we didn't do this to publicize it. We did it because it was the right thing to do. Uh, just crying and saying, you have no idea. I worked my entire life and it got destroyed in one night by Black Lives Matter activists. And I was standing outside saying, I'm, I am Black. Why are you doing this to my store? Um, and it's because it's not about Black lives. You know, it, it, it's just about uh, wanting to make sure America burns until they get power. Um, uh, would you characterize yourself as pro-life or pro-choice? I'm pro-life and I'm unapologetically pro-life, but I do believe that there is a space uh, for pro-lifers uh, to open the conversation with people that are pro-choice in a more meaningful dialogue and realize that these people that are saying they're pro-choice um, the majority of them were brainwashed. I used to be pro-choice. You learn from the time that you're in school. It's a clump of cells. It's the responsible thing to do. Uh, you should be having abortions. You should be doing all of this. So I always And that was in, uh, Candace, that was in public schools. What you're saying is that was pushed on you. High school. In ninth, ninth, 10th, and 11th grade health classes, you learn uh, that it is a clump of cells. Um, and that it's the responsible thing to do. It's, it's all this dogma as this, at the same time that they're sexualizing children, you know, go out, have sex, use a condom. Uh, they're also saying to kids, and if you get pregnant, the responsible thing to do is to kill your child. So a lot of these kids believe um, that this is a clump of cells. If you do it early enough, it's gone. Um, and then, of course, we know that the majority of them suffer from, from post-traumatic stress for their decisions. When I see young women that are outside screaming for the right or, or making fun or mocking the right to like pro-choice, what I see are a bunch of young women that are hurt um, and maybe they're, they're not okay with their decisions. And we have to be able to enter into that conversation with them um, in a more sympathetic or empathetic way. And I try to do that and say, look, just because you were pro-choice, I used to be pro-choice, doesn't mean that you can't change your mind. Even for the girls who had abortions, they could be the loudest voices for the pro-life movement to talk about what they went through, how they were deluded, and what it felt like them coming out the other side. Uh, so we definitely try to do that and create a space for that. You had your aha moment, as I'll characterize it, at CPAC on Blexit. Did you ever have an aha moment when it came to this really sensitive question on when life begins? Um, you know, I, I didn't. I just started studying. I, and when I say studying, I mean I started re-educating myself. Uh, what we're seeing in the public school system is that they're purposefully miseducating children. So they got your kids from kindergarten until the time that they're 18 years old, from five to 18 years old. And they can just completely warp their minds to believe that this is the truth. Six hours a day, they're spending and they're teaching your kids things that are lies, like, like this is not a baby. Um, right. And so for me, when I started to 
get that weird, crazy itch and go, wait a second, maybe this isn't right. And I checked one thing. It was like a domino board. You know, it just all of the chips came down. I, whoa, 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 whoa. And then I realized I had to actually educate myself and I had to actually buy books and I had to actually learn real science. I had to actually learn real history, um, you know, not what we were learning in school. And I took a year and a half off to just study to just study, to read, Thomas Sowell, all these people that I said, these are coons, I would never growing up, right? Uh, these are Uncle Toms, these are race traders, which is ironic, because now it's all the things I get called, so karma is swift. Um, <laughs> I then picked up their books, and um, it felt like I was seeing for the first time, like, that, like that. I had no idea I was sitting in the darkness, like I had no idea that I was sitting underneath a weight, and I had a weight alleviated on me, I did not have to be a victim, and someone turned my lights on, and I saw the world for the first time. Um, and it is to describe the feeling that you get when that happens, um, how free you feel. And I think a good example of that recently is Leo Terrell, who has gone right. the exact opposite way. Go watch tapes of Leo Terrell when he hated Trump versus now. It almost seems like it's a light that's coming out of him. He just seems so much happier. Um, and, and, and that's really what it is. The tr truth is light and lies is darkness. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm grateful that I had so many people, the giants that came before me, Thomas Sowell, Larry Elder, Dr. Ben Carson to sort of whip me into the right reality. And I went through all of the um, emotions of grief, <laughs> cognitive dissonance, trying to bargain with God. I'm like, no, I must be a white supremacist. I'm going to foxnews.com. Like, <laughs> and, then, and then came the acceptance of, okay, this is just the truth. <laughs> so, okay, so, uh... You know, um, my experience on race is probably just the polar opposite of yours. But for a lot of times, uh, you just use those slurs that they use about these great black authors. Um, Thomas Sowell, you know, kind of the dean of that delegation, Shelby Steele, so many. The criticism is written that these are black thinkers, although I don't know how a brain is, thinks in terms of race, but black thinkers that write for a white population. And what you're saying is, for you those black writers helped bring you to a whole different perspective on a whole range of issues. Yeah, they are, they are possibly the most courageous and heroic black people that are walking in this country um, because they did it at a time when it wasn't okay. Uh, they took the smears, they took the heartache and they, and they kept telling the truth and they, and they did so unapologetically. Um, and it, like I say, I wouldn't be where I am today if it hadn't been for them and their willingness to just keep writing the truth and hope that one day people would see it and the truth would become popular. Um, and so it's sad to me that black America is in such a dark spot that we're idolizing LeBron James and Cardi B and we're turning our backs on Condoleezza Rice and Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams and Shelby Steele. Um, that is the state of culture today. And that's something that I'm actively working to transform. Well, I can tell you as the father of five girls, um, that's not a black problem. The <laughs> cultural problems, you know, this cancer, this crap that gets produced um, uh, is prevalent in almost every shape, matter, form. And it's a hard thing to people who, to conservatives and libertarians who have an open attitude about the fact that people should be able to make decisions about their life. And we're really the, the furthest thing from prudes. Um, we also want them to enrich their souls and their minds so they get to a better place. And um, it's a sad thing that that's not happening yet. Yeah. What impact can you have on that? You must be able to have a bigger impact than I can have. <laughs> well, you know, I, I've done, I think what I have understood is um, that the left is playing the game culturally, culturally and why can't we? And I definitely have tried to uh, use humor. And I think we're seeing a lot more creativity on the Republic. We've just never seen this before. The Republican Party is entirely different um, under Donald Trump. Uh, uh, we're, we're memeing better, we're funnier, uh, and we're making fast videos that deliver a point. We're telling jokes, we're making it okay to be funny. And, and actually the irony is that we're seeing the left become increasingly less funny. They can't take a joke. Um, uh, and, and people are realizing, wow, you guys are so serious. You're upset. Every, every time you look up, you're finding something to be upset about. So I think we're being more inviting. And 
And for me, I always take shots at the idols, um, you know, and I, I tend to get into spats with, with rappers and basketball players publicly uh, to re reveal them for what they are, you know, ignorant people that are sheep that are being led, sheep that are being led, um, and they have no idea, you know, why they put on a Beto cap. They have no idea. It's just what they think is the right thing to do. Um, at this moment in time, the NBA is basically being used um, as a banner. I mean, they're, they're, they're nothing more than a billboard for Black Lives Matter. And yet, if you ask a single one of those players, where does the money go to for this organization that you've painted on the floor? None of them can answer the question, right? Um, and that's what I'm trying to show these people. It's okay um, to like somebody for their talents. It's okay to be a fan of LeBron James. But when you think that being a fan of LeBron James means that you have to adapt his perspective on every other subject, you're being fooled. Um, I like politics. I know politics. But because I'm in politics and I've got millions of followers and I've that I don't think that I should be the person advising Elon Musk on how to build rockets. Uh, you know what I mean? So not our it, specialties. Not our specialties. Um, <laughs> and for some reason, we've given Hollywood this platform where now they're able to speak out on everything and it should become the word of God. Um, and that's idolatry and it's foolish and it's wrong. And the NBA, uh, you know, obviously looks the other way when there are human rights deals, really uh, terrible behavior by the government in Beijing against the freedom fighters in Hong Kong. They just look the other way. So I think that's a, the hard part here is that if you're going to be a human rights crusader, um, you can't have these massive blind spots. Right, right, exactly. And it's massive blind spots. And then it's like the one spot that they're looking at doesn't exist. You know what I mean? Right. We don't have a police brutality, racially motivated police brutality issue in this country. There isn't a single you know, data point or metric they can point to that would expose otherwise. Um, but they, they actively avoid the facts in favor of emotion. Uh, because as I said, they're being used like pawns and serving an area that's much bigger than they can even understand. What did you think recently? I, I read about the uh, the Academy of Motion Picture in Hollywood saying that they were actually going to change the way they nominated actors and movies for this prestigious award uh, and kind of have their own version of affirmative action uh, on giving the golden statues. Did you have a reaction to that? I did. I saw that now it's going to be a requirement. You got to have one gay person, one black person. I don't know what you, Matt, but I'm excited to see them do a uh, historical drama on Mao Zedong and make everybody a lesbian, trans, black person um, in China or retell an old English uh, story and pretend that everyone was black. I mean, it's just foolishness. It's, 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 it's complete. It's craziness. Um, could, I mean, could you imagine a world where you can no longer tell history as it was? Because that's what they're essentially saying. Um, a lot of these movies, think about the blockbuster 300. There's a reason why they, they, they pick actors that look like that. They didn't pick a bunch of, you know, redheaded Scottish people to play these parts because what they were trying to do was actually tell something um, that was historically true. This almost goes in line with their attempt to, to uh, get rid of history, right? To pretend history didn't happen, to rewrite history. Um, you know, the 1619 Project, doing all of these things where you're now trying to pretend um, things were the way they weren't. And, and what it really does, uh, you know, is, is it strips away from the creative industry. I'm hoping that like this is actually going to have an equal, in, uh, 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 opposite desired effect and going to, to see people in Hollywood now say, oh, the left has gone so far that I wanted to make a movie, um, you know, about Mao. And I now I know that this movie could be amazing, could be the best thing I've ever created because I have all Chinese people in it rightfully, and I don't, I haven't featured a trans person, I, my, my movie's not going to be up for a reward. And then here's, here's what begs the question. I'm pregnant right now. My child will be biracial. My child will be half black and half white. Um, is my child half privileged, half oppressed? Where do they fit into this scope, right? The left is so narrow-minded that they actually view our society in terms of two colors, black and white. And we don't live in that climate anymore. We live in an extremely racially diverse climate. And I'm so tired of this narrative, right? That, it, that, that they're basically going back to the Democrats of, their, of the heyday. Everything is about race. All you can be is a black person. All you can be in a white, is a white person. And we can assign a bunch of various attributes to you because of the order again. Well, I'm going to take that as a little bit of a direction. Maybe we should stop talking about issues that are perceived with uh, the black community and just start talking about America because right. you're somebody who loves this country. Um, and uh, as you look across this country, what worries you the most about America's history, America's greatness continuing on in the years to come? Do you think it's at threat and what threatens it? Uh, 
what threatens it is, is what threatens everything, lies, you know, lies and people perceiving them to be truths. Uh, but more than that, it's, it's when, you know, as the famous quote, when good men do nothing. Um, I have been happy to be in the fire. I have, happy, have been happy to be in the controversy. Um, I have been happy to allow them to smear me, libel me, and to get up the next day. And I know you've been the same way. You and your wife have been the exact same way, and there's a reason for that, because I would have a lot more regrets if I did nothing. Um, I would have a lot more regrets uh, if I cared so much about what my Wikipedia page says, that I allowed these lies to go on, allow them to poison our youth, allow them to tell our children they can you know, pick their genders when they're five and six years old and encouraging them to mutilate their bodies. Um, I have used every bit of my platform to say, I do not agree with these narratives. What is socialism? Socialism is bad. If, if it takes, you know, being called a racist, a white supremacist, a self-hating black, a woman, Uncle Tom, all the words that they've called me, for me to know that I am leading this country in a direction where my children can grow up with the same opportunities and freedoms that I was afforded in my youth. Uh, and that's a risk I'm more than happy to take every single day. And I think we need more Americans with that same spirit. Um, do you think that it is consistent with uh, American history that America could actually embrace socialism, or do you think those two concepts are inconsistent? I think the concepts are inconsistent, and I will tell you why. Well, one thing that makes America different, I think, is that we are such a big country. Um, you know, and I think just when they get close to sort of manufacturing something, there just tends to be America has an awakening. I mean, Trump should have never won the election, according to, you know, what I, it, it, everybody was against him. The Republican Party was against him. The Democrat Party was against him. The media was against him. And yet there was something in the heart of America that realized that something was going very wrong and Americans individually united together and stood up against it. And now more Americans are awake than ever before of, of really what that was that inspired this Trump character to need to come to the forefront and become the president of the United States. So, you know, I always, I always believe that God really has his hand in America. Um, I think America goes and so does Western civilization. And uh, there's only, you know, one type of a civilization in the West, um, which is in line with, with, with the beliefs of God. You know, we are one nation under God, truly. This nation was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Um, and and socialism, it's, it's just like Winston Churchill said, you know, it's a doctrine of greed and of envy and of selfishness. And, and that's not what America is. Um, and so that's why, that's why we do what we do every single day. And you appeal a lot to younger people. Of course, I'm getting to be like not one of the younger people anymore. So uh, <laughs> people much younger than me. And, uh, you know, we're, we read and we hear about how younger voters and younger Americans like this idea of socialism. They like the idea of the government doing more and more. And, and obviously they've been taught less and less um, about the founding principles, which we've already talked about, that goes through both our public and private schools, unfortunately, kind of a disregard for the, um, for the history of, uh, of America. In you know, CPAC, 50% of the people that show up at CPAC every year in Washington, DC are kids, high school and college students. Um, we have a lot of other great groups that are involved in talking to kids. Do you think the kids of America are kind of lost to this idea that they've embraced these leftist ideas, or do you think it's much more mixed? Uh, I would say my generation, the millennials, ruined everything. Um, and I am, <laughs> more, <laughs> I am much more optimistic about the generation beneath mine, Generation Z, uh, because they're being raised by the internet and conservatives are winning the internet. But my generation, uh, you know, hopelessly lost. And I think uh, it is because of the education system and we didn't have the internet per se. We were TV people, but the Facebooks and Twitter came when I was just leaving high school. Um, and, you know, I think... It, there's there's a lot of different elements. Uh, I think first and foremost, you have an education system that's actively seeking to infantilize, um, you know, growing adults. I mean, young young children moving on to adults, they're infantilizing them. And so when you talk about socialism catching fire, what you're talking about is a toddler-esque uh, approach to how life should be lived. If you spoke to a toddler and you said, how should society run? They would say everything should be free because that's the right thing. That's a nice thing, mommy. That's a nice thing, daddy. And it's very sweet because you're a toddler. Um, and now we have in the education system, rather than teaching hard academics, rather than teaching kids about capitalism versus socialism, about the free markets and why the free market is the only solution to lift groups out of poverty, they're re we're replacing them with toddler 
training courses, psychological conditioning. How did this make you feel today? I know I gave you an F, but do you still feel good? Ta-da! You know, a kid, it's like a toddler, they do something and they make a picture and like, how do you like it, mommy? Um, and you know, when your parents, three-year-old, it's beautiful, I love it. But then there comes that age where you kind of gotta be like, listen, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be an artist. <laughs> and we have a school system that's not doing that. Um, and they're, they're re really trying to draw out this toddler phase and producing narcissistic Marxists um, coming out of the school system who actually believe that everything can and should be free. Okay, so how are you and your husband going to raise your kids? Are you going to send, you going to homeschool them, Candace? Uh, I'm, I'm pro homeschool. My husband's like, let's send them to England because the schools are better there. My husband's English. I am pro homeschool. Uh, if, if we end up putting them in a private school, uh, then I will tell you that I will be the teacher. I, I will be so into my kids' work that they, they will eventually capitulate to what I believe <laughs> that the curriculum needs to be because my kid's not going to be learning any fluff. It's going to be hardcore. Um, you know, I, I am a, a staunch conservative and uh, my kids will be as well. I, I can guarantee you, I haven't said whether it's a boy or girl, but it is a Republican. <laughs> so uh, this is a show about books. What books would you, are you going to make sure your kids read? First one, Thomas Sowell, the one that saved my life, right? That's a, that's a must have. Um, it's called uh, Intellectuals in Race. Um, and then I would say, yeah, I think they'll have a whole shelf of Walter Williams, Shelby Steele, White Guilt. That should be mandatory reading for every white person in America. Stop being guilty. Uh, grab a spine about it um, and realize that you're destroying everything that the civil rights era built upon. How the West won, I think by Rodney Stark is an important one. It, people should know why the West is the best as we have people pushing to get rid of Western. I think they have actually successfully gotten rid of Western civilization across all universities because they let a group of black protesters uh, saying, hey, ho, hey, ho, Western Civ has got to go. So we need to make sure we're conditioning kids to understand what actually built the West, why it's so great and why we fight to protect it. So I say between those three books, <laughs> why the West won, um, Thomas Sowell Intellectuals and Race and Shelby Steele's White Guilt might be the first three books that my kid reads when they're five. <laughs> it's so interesting. We've talked so much about race, and obviously when people talk about Western Civ and Christopher Columbus, they always like to put it within the context of exporting slavery, uh, but they fail to also talk about this idea of spreading the good news, uh, the good news that Martin Luther King Sr. and Jr. Uh, spent their lives dedicated to preaching, and uh, you in your own life with your grandfather had an interesting uh, spiritual walk yourself, which you talk about in the book, which I, which I thought was really personal and really interesting. Um, one of those books you want your kids to read, would it, would it include the Bible? It would definitely include the Bible. That's the first book. They'll be raised like I was raised to uh, read Bible scriptures every single morning at breakfast and to be asked questions. I mean, my book of Bible stories, uh, me and my sisters loved that growing up. And those were the lessons that were so quiet they didn't even seem like they were that they were lessons you know my grandfather just it was a part of our habits eating breakfast should read the bible um and thank goodness for that and i talk about that a lot in my book because i came back to those values and those principles uh once i was led astray and, and became this selfish horrible narcissistic individual in my early college career and believed like yeah hey, it's all about me and feminism and and then i i you know had a, an abrupt awakening and realized i was miserable that the time, last time I remember being happy was when there were rules, when there were regulations, when there was structure. Um, and, uh, and people need to understand that people tend to think of rules as bondage when in fact it's freedom. Personal responsibility is freedom. Making the right decision is freedom. Um, and, and we're having the left, which is pushing against that, who's asking for no rules, no regulations, no law enforcement, nothing. Um, and, and that leads to just chaos and unhappiness. Are there, is there anybody who would be characterized in American politics as being from the left, Democratic Party, um, who you consider a hero? Uh, Hillary for losing. <laughs> you are, you do have a sense of the ironic. That's good. Okay, well then let me ask you an easier question. Heroic, a heroic loss. Who, it was a heroic loss. Who are your heroes? Uh, my grandfather, first and foremost, my grandmother passed. She is still one of my heroes, but I mean, in terms of people that are alive, I would say uh, Thomas Sowell and my grandfather, I think. And then, um, you know, I'd probably say my husband, 
Um, you know, like it just. Uh, I love that answer, by the way. I think it's a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell Mercedes. It's a really good answer. But great my answer. husband, you know, I, and you get this when you meet a partner that can like knows what you want to do when you meet the right partner. Um, yeah. And especially for people like us, right? We're just in the fire. Like it's not easy to find someone who just gets it and believes that you can do it. That's the big thing, like believing and having that partner um, who believes in an idea that seems bigger than you. Uh, you can't beat that. You know, that's, that's, that, that's literally, that's from God. So um, I, I love marriage. I'm a big anti-feminist and uh, anti-radical feminist. And um, I believe that having a good partner is, is one of the greatest gifts of life. What would you say to people? We've covered some really controversial topics uh, as we've had this conversation. And uh, obviously you're used to being controversial. I'm used to being controversial, but there's a lot of people who are gonna watch this conversation and uh, they could get offended by one part or another. What would be your response to them? Would it be tough? I have my opinions. If you don't like them, fine. Or would it be keep listening, mm -hmm. keep staying engaged? Because much like you, the more the more we listen to each other and try to understand the point of view, the more people might understand your point of view and come to believe those very same ideas. Right. I would I would probably say to them that feeling of uh, being offended is a feeling, right? So um, if you can put your feelings aside and actually try to debate what it is that you disagree with, um, you might find that we have more common ground because I, I like to think I see outside of facts. Um, and, and I understand that in, a, in such a politically polarized world, it can be hard to have conversations because so many people are invested in their feelings. Um, and yeah, I always say keep listening. I have people on the left that I speak to all the time on my show. People tend to forget that I have Democrats in my family. You know what I mean? And um, my hope is that the moderate Dems will find their voices because right now the left has sort of seized, um, I think, their narrative as well. And I hope that we're reaching out to a lot of people that are are just curious. Maybe they're political refugees uh, who don't recognize the point that they want to stick with. I know that's how people in my family feel. Uh, they're, they, they consider themselves to be Democrats. They certainly don't support rioting and looting and burning things down to get what you want. Um, so maybe be like I was. I was curious enough to type a different perspective and go on a different website that I, I never would go on. And I was shocked to find that those values were actually very much in line with my own. So stay curious. Now, would you consider this book an autobiography? It's autobiographical in content. So I definitely yeah. insert a lot of personal stories in there, but it's not a full autobiography. <laughs> Are you, do, you, do you think it's a fair criticism? Some people say, oh, she's too young to write an autobiography. She hasn't lived her full life yet. <laughs> no, you're not. You're not too young to do anything. If I've learned anything, I've done a lot in these last four years. I'm, I'm just dedicated. You know, I, I love what I do. Um, I, I definitely, definitely, like I said, it's not a full biography. I don't have kids yet. They'd be upset if that was my final biography, right? <laughs> Mom, right. you might have the thirty years of your life when you had children. Kids, uh, <laughs> kids can seriously mess up with your plans. I just want you to know that. <laughs> <laughs> How many? You got five. Five, yeah. Oh, six then. <laughs> okay, you gotta outdo me. That's that's a that's a battle. I might want you to win. Now, okay, so you write this book. I'm not going to ask you how old you are, but 31. 20 years. That's what I figured. 20 years from now, what do you think you're going to be doing? I don't know. And the reason why I stopped guessing is because you had told me six years ago that I'd be a conservative or Republican and supporting Donald Trump for president. I would have thought you were crazy and that you were, um, you know, on drugs. So uh, I think it's all in God's hands. Um, and I'm just doing what I believe is right every single day, working incredibly hard. Um, my focus, obviously, for November is to make sure that we secure another four years for Donald Trump. I think the whole of Western civilization depends on it. Um, but I'm one foot in front of the other and living my best life. And I'm optimistic every single day uh, that we're winning. So we've covered a lot of topics. We've covered husbands, families, racism in this country. Let's talk about the most interesting thing that's going on in this presidential campaign. You obviously support Donald Trump and uh, you uh, are very uh, public about that and interesting about that. Tell me, buddy, who's watching this, you know, what was your personal interaction with the president that kind of bonded this? Um, you know, when I first uh, realized that I liked him, it was actually because of the media, not Trump. 
uh, the media woke me up to the fact that they lie incessantly um, and in, that they were in a fever pitch. And it was because he had listed, I was not for him when he came down the escalator. I was like, who is this? This would be crazy. Uh, we can't go from Obama to Trump, you know? And then I listened to his speech in Dimmendale, Michigan, where he started listing all of the various statistics of Black America, um, all of the ways that we're suffering, talking about our neighborhoods and the condition of the inner cities. And I knew it all to be true because I came from an impoverished background. My family and relatives, are, many of them are on welfare. Uh, so I, I knew what he was talking about. It was the truth. And then I watched the media spin that truth and say that he was a racist and a sexist and a misogynist and all of these things. And I went, wait a second, this guy's been on TV for decades. You're telling me you just now realize that this guy's literally Hitler and that he's just been flying under the radar? Um, so it forced me to just challenge myself and say something seems to be amiss. Um, and the more I studied, the more I realized that he was on the side of truth uh, and that what people didn't like about him was that he was saying it and that maybe perhaps I had also got uncomfortable with truth, with hearing the truth. Um, meeting him was exactly as I, as I expected it to be. He's really warm, extremely infectious, and very funny. And that's why the media works in overtime to create this hideous caricature of him. Because the truth is, if he walked into your room, you'd be, you'd be converted in a second. Um, he's aware of what everybody else is saying about him. He's in on the joke. Um, he can take a joke. He can, he can toss out a joke. He gives it as good as he gets. Um, and the biggest thing is he loves this country. Uh, this man is making sacrifices he does not did not need to make as a billionaire. He should be golfing somewhere, um, you know, offering commentary occasionally on what's happening in the White House. Instead, he wakes up every day and he fights like hell, um, you know, to save America. And, and so this this man, I mean, he he is, in my opinion, the greatest president that we've ever had in America. And his legacy, it'll take decades before it settles. Do you think that um, this, you know, one of the things that he's done so uh, uh, successfully is bring some new issues to the fold for Republicans. I think specifically of uh, immigration, of trade, of a different approach to China. Um, are there any of those sets of issues that are more appealing to you than others? Immigration. Um, and, and that's, again, just talking about uh, if you really understand what that's doing to our economy and how that negatively, again, impacts black Americans. Sure. Um, uh, and I think immigration is probably the issue that I'm, I'm the strongest on. I wrote about it in my books. People can really understand um, when you're saying that we should have porous, you know, porous borders. Uh, what you're basically saying is that you want to harm black men uh, that are young and don't have a college degree between the ages of 18 and 22. Uh, and that study was done, by the way, um, of, of how harmful. Well, um, and I'm not talking, I'm talking about illegal immigration, <laughs> I should say, we should clarify illegal immigration. That study was commissioned under Barack Obama in 2012, uh, which exposed that. So this was not a thing that became known when Trump became president. It's always been known. He's just the first one doing something about it. Um, and uh, so I think, uh, and of course, China is, of course, a huge, huge threat. Uh, anybody who's a business owner understands that. But um, I, I think our, our protecting our borders is always number one. Do you think one of the reasons why Republicans had trouble uh, talking about illegal immigration is because they just, so much of the party is characterized as being white and they just don't want to touch these issues that immediately get even close to this topic of race? Yeah. Republicans are completely terrified to be called racist. I mean, the second they get called racist, they shut down. And that's why it had to be Trump. Because Trump doesn't shut down, he doubles down. It's like, <laughs> they're like, excuse me? What did you say, Mr. President? That was racist. And he's like, I said, what did you have to lose, Black America? And then he triples down, and he quadruples down. Um, and that's what we needed. We needed someone who wasn't going to cower or whimper and run away when he was fraudulently labeled a racist. And now it's like no one cares because the word has become so meaningless. I mean, they're calling me a white supremacist. Like, it doesn't matter anymore, guys. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it, it, they've exposed themselves as people that are just trying to censor speech and shut people down by calling them racists. Um, and I think in many ways, it's time for Republicans to take this opportunity and fight back, you know? Um, and I'm a big believer, like, you know, don't let people smear you and libel you as racists. Fight. Take the fight to them um, because they shouldn't be allowed to do it. I, I, I am for the reversal of New York Times versus Sullivan. I think it's BS that as public figures, they're allowed to lie. They're allowed to pretend I'm a white supremacist or I'm a supporter of Adolf Hitler simply because um, I'm a public figure. Um, so I hope that's one thing that transforms in the future is that they reverse New York Times versus Sullivan and, and hold these journalists accountable for the lies that they print that divide this nation. So in the era of Trump, which has changed politics so much, I'm going to try this question again. I'm going to try a different angle. 
Do you ever see yourself putting your name on a ballot and run for office? I get this is probably the question I get number one the most. Are you saying I'm I'm not a creative interviewer? <laughs> <laughs> People ask me this all the time in, in the first you know year or so. I used to always say no, it's not for me. But then I saw that an old interview of Donald Trump uh, decades ago, and he said, uh, you know, if I felt that my country really needed me and no one else. Uh, could step to the plate and, and, and win, I would do it. And I think that that's how I feel. I feel that if, if there was a, I, I definitely don't want it or aspire to, I think it should be like wanting to go to war. It's like, you don't want to go to war, but if you had to fight for your country, you would. And that's what Trump is doing. Um, and I would make that sacrifice if I felt that I looked at all the Republicans running and I knew that they couldn't win and they were running against someone like AOC. And I felt the future of America was on the line. I'd put my name on the ballot, I would run and I would win. <laughs> That's great. And let me ask you this. Is there anybody else out there, not maybe involved in politics, but maybe in elected office, but somebody else out there who you admire and think would be uh, a great president as well? Oh, gosh, it's so hard because I, I just love so many of them where they are. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think yeah, totally. the real fighters now uh, in the Senate. And I'm like, the Senate would just be a mess if we didn't have people like Ted Cruz and Dan Crench. I mean, I mean, uh, Dan Crenshaw's in the House, but, you know, fighting and saying these things that need to be said. Um, but I don't know. It's hard. Like, who do I think could win? Not just who I think should run. I could name tons of people I think should run. But who do I think should win? And it's just like, I don't, I don't know. Maybe we don't know who it is yet. Maybe it's a random person. Uh, oh, do you, if I had asked you before the escalator uh, and before the announcement in Trump Tower, uh, my guess is it would be a hard thing to predict. And yeah. there are a lot of changes. Uh, and uh, I would just like to say to you, um, Candace, that uh, you're such an interesting voice out there in politics. And we appreciate what you do and what your perspective is. And like I said, I know a lot of people probably disagree with you on all kinds of issues, but it's wonderful the spirit in which you go right at it with your point of view. I think if you keep doing that, not only hopefully will more people uh, understand your point of view and come to your side, I think it'll make Americans understand that it's okay to debate and disagree and we can do it in the right way. Right, exactly. No, there's, no, there's no harm, no foul. We just need people to be more courageous. You're allowed to have an opinion. You're allowed to have the wrong opinion. You know, that's allowed in this country, believe it or not. Um, and I just, I hope that if, if I do anything, it's just that I inspire more conservatives to speak out boldly. Thank you very much for uh, agreeing to talk with me, uh, this novice uh, journalist. I'm not really a journalist, as you know, but this novice questioner. Uh, I loved reading your book, and I know that the people around the country and the people watching this conversation are going to go out and get it. Thanks for writing. I know it takes a lot of time and a lot of dedication. Thank you so much, Matt. I'll see you soon. Talk soon, my friend. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org.